prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for the grace that you give us. I personally thank you for last week's uh, World Youth Day. Thank you for Joyce and Jackie's presentation that they gave here at RCIA. And I ask tonight that you fill our hearts with a deeper understanding of marriage, deeper understanding of your call to union and communion, and our love of you here on earth. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. If I the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony. We're going to talk about it in the context of what is known as the theology of the body and God's ultimate calling for all of us to be in union with Him for all eternity. So, uh, here we go. At the basis of this presentation, we're going to, it's almost going to be a little bit like a philosophy course because we're going to ask questions not so much about like hey, what does the church teach about marriage? We want to actually look at, like, what does it mean to be a human being? So, great question. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be male or female? What does it mean to be sexual? What does it mean to love? These are all, like, questions that philosophers ask, not often theologians, people that study theology. So, a question, genuinely, that, like, it would be awesome, like, if I just asked right now, like, what does it mean for you to be a human being? What does it mean for you to be a male? What does it mean for you to be a female? Like these are questions that actually our society right now is radically redefining. Well, if we look at sacred scripture, there's very clear understandings of what it means to be human, what it means to be male, what it means to be female, what it means to be sexual, and what it means to be in love. So, in the basic essence of what we believe it means to be human, we mean we. we Define a human being as a human. A human being is an individual with a physical body and an immortal soul. So we have physical bodies and immortal souls. We believe those bodies and souls become one at the moment of conception in, a, in its mother's womb. We believe that death is the separation of a body and a soul, and yet we believe in the resurrection of the dead, so we actually believe that at the end of time when Christ comes again, our bodies and souls will reunite. We believe that God did make us male and female. We were intended to be male and female, and how we were created by God is how we're called to live out our masculinity and our femininity. And we believe that it does define us. And we actually believe that the more that one actually understands their masculinity, and the more they want to understand their femininity, the more they will actually live and find joy in their life. The more masculine I become, the more I will thrive. We'll get to that. We also believe that God has an actual very clear set plan for what it means to be a sexual human being. That our sexuality is really, really good. Often our world particularly from a religious point of view, will say we need to suppress sexuality or sexuality is bad or sexuality is tainted. No, we want to say in this presentation that actually sexuality is beyond our understanding and that sexuality is something really, really, really holy. And that love is key to not only understanding all of this, but actually living it out. And that God's definition of love and how we understand love should ultimately define us. So, in these questions, what does it mean to be a human being and what does it mean to live out of humanity is the essence of what we're asking tonight. And they're great questions for you to just ponder for the rest of your life. <laughs> what does it mean that I'm a human being and I'm not a squirrel? What does it mean that I'm a human being and I'm not a cat? What does it mean that I'm a human being created in God's image and likeness? What's key is this. We need to ask this question first before we ever ask this question. However, if we really look at our world, everyone always asks this question without ever asking this question. So like I asked three seniors in high school today at track practice, so what are you doing when you graduate? We're constantly asking people what they're doing. I didn't say to these seniors in high school, so like, who are you? Like, how do you see yourself as a human being? How do you see yourself as a child of God? How do you see yourself in God's divine plan? 
If we asked those questions first, we would actually answer these questions more fruitfully. But we often live a lot in this world and ignoring this world. And we need to, in this presentation, hopefully come to a deeper understanding of that. So, St. John Paul II, who died in uh, 2005, for a large part of the time when he was Pope, he wrote what is known as the Theology of the Body. This is one of the quotes from it. I'm going to try to have this not be a heady presentation. And I'm trying to get, like, bring it down. because If you read the Theology of the Body, it's like a 400-page book. It's very philosophical. It's really, really good, actually. But like, this is trying to take some high-level theology and philosophy and bring it down. So this is the only quote you're going to see. But he says this, the body, and in fact, it alone is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It, the body, was created to transfer to the visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden since time immemorial in God, and thus be assigned to it. Pope John Paul II is ultimately saying this, that our body was created by God to communicate to the world a message. Our body was created... My body was created, your body was created, and they were created differently as male and female to communicate to the whole entire world who God is and what God wants to do. So it was created to transform visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden since time immemorial in God and thus to be assigned. Our bodies are created of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. Our bodies, our physical bodies, particularly our naked physical bodies, are going to communicate to the world who God is and what God does. Our bodies are created to, create, to communicate who God is and what God does. So here we go. In the book of Genesis, if we look at the book of Genesis, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3... And I have these here in your notes, so hopefully you can kind of go home and, and read them again. But we're going to see some very clear commands of God. Man and woman are created distinctly. A man is different than a woman. Adam is created first. Eve is created for Adam. And they were created for union. Meaning, Eve was created to complete Adam. And Adam was created to complete Eve. There is no sexual act without both Adam and Eve. Their bodies were created to actually create a union among each other. They were also commanded by God. The first command given to man and woman is to be fruitful and multiply. We also hear very clearly that Adam and Eve are completely and totally equal. Well, we're going to break some of this down a little bit. And then we find in these first three chapters that sin dismantles all of this. Sin destroys the union between men and women. It destroys the fruitfulness between men and women. And it destroys the equality between men and women. And we still pay for it today. Turn on the news any single night and you're probably going to see one of these issues in the news. Either under the devise of divorce, abortion, abuse, inequality of men and women, or the way that individuals treat each other. It was not intended by God. All of that is, is, is a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. So we're going to kind of break this down here a little bit. So, from the book of Genesis, let us create man in our image and after our likeness. So when God is speaking, and it's very important that God is speaking, or this is the book of Genesis, by the way, and God is speaking in the plural, why would God be speaking in the plural? Because who is God? God is who? Father, 
Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Which is awesome because even though the Trinity hasn't been completely and totally made known yet, in the book of Genesis, in the opening pages, God is speaking in the plural. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and our likeness. So then how does God the Father make man? Well, he makes them male and female. Why? We've talked about this before in a few of the other classes, but when we talk about the, the Trinity, we believe the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father. And the love is so real between them that we name it and call it the Holy Spirit. In the Creed, we profess that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So the love between the Father and the Son is so real that it actually is a third person. In marriage, Timmy loves Susie, Susie loves Timmy, Timmy loves Susie, Susie loves Timmy. They get engaged, they hold hands for the first time. Timmy loves Susie, Susie loves Timmy, Timmy loves Susie, Susie loves Timmy. They get married, they kiss for the first time. Nine months later, they have a baby. If that's how you think it works, then go to sex ed class. But you know what I mean? <laughs> the love between Timmy and Susie is so real that it actually is a third person. So when we talk about God making man in his image and his likeness, he does literally make them in his image. Because who is God? God is three distinct persons. Who is really one? How does God make mankind? Male and female. And what's his first command to them? Go forth and multiply. So God makes in his image and likeness a communion of persons that's related, that, that's related in unity, communion, equality, and love. He creates a perfect image of himself in humanity here on earth. Are we following me? Okay. This is awesome. Okay, by the way, both of these images are from where? Sistine Chapel. Who painted the Sistine Chapel? Michelangelo. It's a teenage, teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Big ladders. Um, this is really interesting, by the way. So Michelangelo, like, would dissect bodies and stuff, and he was, he's a fascinating creature. If you want to watch a really cool movie, it's an old movie, but it's called The Agony and the Ecstasy. It's like from the era of, like, the huge, great movies with Charles Heston and all these great people. Charleston actually plays Michelangelo in the film. And the movie that actually is actually, the whole film is about the painting of the Sistine Chapel. And all the drama that surrounded it. But anyways, Michelangelo, when he created this image, this is God the Father, giving life to Adam. If you look at this cloth around God the Father, it's the exact shape of a cranium. So if you cut my head in half this way, and this would be the spinal cord. Michelangelo is saying within this that the mind of God, the power of God, is literally being infused into Adam. So God's life is being given into Adam through the touch of the finger. It would be the implanting of the soul into this body which would be made out of clay. That's how God made out of it. He was made out of clay and then he breathed life into it. So this is the creation of man. And that, I, just, I, don't know, I think art is awesome. Art's like... Okay. This is from where? The Sistine Chapel. And who's the artist? Michael. Okay. So now you have God the Father. But God the Father this time is calling Eve out of Adam. Remember, God puts Adam to sleep takes a rib, and then creates the woman. Okay? We've talked about this before, about Jesus on the cross. And out of Jesus' side, what is born out of Jesus' side? Through blood and water, what is born out of Jesus' side? The church. Out of Jesus' side, the blood and water, it's the church, which is Jesus' spouse, his bride, is the church. So in the book of Genesis, out of Adam's side, the first man, Jesus is the new Adam, Adam, and out of Jesus' side comes the church. 
out of the first Adam comes Eve. This is the first time that a naked man seems a naked woman. What does Adam say the first time that he sees a naked woman ever in the history of all humanity? This is his quote. At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Up until this point, Adam had named all the other animals in the garden, and he named them different. Zebra, giraffe, hippopotamus, I don't know, unicorn. Nobody. Um, if I told you about my, my track, there was a guy that showed up for track practice, and he had the coolest shirt on, and it was, it was, a, it was a huge rhinoceros. And you know, like around, it was, so it was this huge rhinoceros, and it had like a horn coming, and it said "fat unicorn." <laughs> like, that is so awesome. Okay, um, but Adam named all the animals, and in naming them, he, he's he's saying you're different. When Eve is created, his response is "bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh." What is he saying? Total equality. Total union. This is before they fall. After they fall, when disruption enters in, all the drama and all the hatred and all of the inequality, what is the first thing that Adam and Eve do when they fall? They cover the parts of, the, that, of themselves that define them as male and, women, male, male and female. They don't cover the parts of their body. They don't cover their elbows. They don't cover their earlobes. They cover the parts that define them as male and female. Why? Because they began to look at each other as objects. They realized that the other person was using them. And they needed to protect themselves from being used. Prior to the fall, that wasn't the case. Prior to the fall, Adam looked at Eve and rejoiced. Eve looked at Adam and rejoiced. And there was freedom. After the fall, sin enters in. And it, it literally dismantles the unity and the equality and the fruitfulness that's intended. Eve now, Adam now wants to use Eve for his pleasure. Instead of Adam wanting to give himself to serve Eve, things become dismantled. So, we're going to uh, shift now to Ephesians chapter 5. So that, that's God's original plan. God's original plan is union, communion, faithfulness, fruitfulness. Now we're going to talk about uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. To do so, we're going to talk about the sacrament of holy matrimony. By now, we should have kind of some understanding of the sacrament. A sacrament is a sign or a symbol instituted by Christ that brings forth grace. A sign or a symbol instituted by Christ, which means that somewhere Christ actually makes this sacrament clear or known, that brings forth grace. What is, what is the tangible symbol for the sacrament of holy matrimony? Rings. It's not rings. No. That's a trick, actually. I put that out there totally to fool everybody. <laughs> what, is, what is, so I'll give you an analogy. In the sacrament of baptism, what physical element is needed? In the, in the sacrament of holy Eucharist, what two physical elements are needed? Bread and wine. In the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, what tangible element is needed? Oil. Oil. In the sacrament of holy matrimony? Vows. What? The vows. No, oh, the, yeah. you're really close. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> Male and female. A man and a woman who are, able to act, who are able to enter into sexual relations with each other, who are not married to another person, nor related to each other. So this is actually what's necessary for the sacrament of holy matrimony. Why? If I look at water, I can be like, okay, I get it, baptism, cleansing from sin, new life. If I look at bread and wine, I can be like, okay, I get it, food. If I look at oil, I can be like, okay, strength, healing. If I look at a naked body of a man, naked body of a woman, I'm like, what? Well, I don't get it. Like, how is this a symbol of God? Well, Ephesians chapter 5 decodes it for us. In Ephesians chapter 5, you can open up Ephesians chapter 5, you can just trust me. Um, but St. Paul makes it very clear that every man is called to be a groom, every man is called to be a husband and a father, every man is called to be an image of Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Every woman is called to be a bride, 
Every woman is called to be a wife and a mother, and every woman is called to be an image of the church, which is the body of Christ. And when I say every, I mean every. So what is my name? My name is what? Father Meyer. I'm a man. What does that make me? That means that I am also a groom. So who is my bride? I'm a husband. Who is my wife? As a priest, I stand in the place of Christ. When I baptize, I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When I celebrate Holy Eucharist, I, I say, this is my body. And at Mass, I stand as the head of the gathered body. That's why I sit in a chair that's different than from other people. Amanda McCann from our parish entered the Sister Servants of Our Lady of Martyra. She is now a... She's, so she's a woman. What is... Amanda McCann right now. Why does she have a veil on her head? Because she is now a... She is a wife because she's married to who? Christ. That's why she wears a veil on her head and a ring on her finger. The four foot eight woman who lived in Calcutta, what did we call her? Mother Teresa. Did Mother Teresa ever have sexual relations and bring forth children? No. Did Mother Teresa have children? Yes, spiritual children, just as I have spiritual children myself, why I'm called Father. Amanda McCann, and every woman is called to be an image of the church, which is the body of Christ. This will make more sense as we get into the whole section on femininity and females. So this is true for all men and women, not just for those who are in the sacrament of holy matrimony, but particularly when you enter the sacrament of holy matrimony, a man is called to be an image of Christ, a woman is called to be an image of the church. Now, the union that exists between a man and a woman in the sacrament of holy matrimony is going to be the same as what exists between Christ and his church. So can Christ ever leave his church? No. Can the church leave Christ? No. Can a head, this is all very clear by the way, if you check out Ephesians chapter 5. What is the only sure way to kill a human being? Come on, psychopaths. <laughs> what is the only absolute sure way to kill a human being? Decapitation, right? I, mean, I don't know how many times you've tried this, but if you try to shoot, you try to kill somebody by shooting, you might miss, or you might just hit their arm and then they don't die, or if you try to like, you know, like slip that their wrist or something like that, that may not work, and so like if you try to poison them, then there might be an antidote, or if you whatever, like you know, crack their skull open, like there might be something that can tape it back together. So the only sure way to actually kill someone is to cut off her head. St. Paul like uses this analogy. Because between Christ and his church, the union that exists between a head and a body is the same as the union that exists between Christ and his church. And if this is true, that, when a, that means that when a man and a woman become a groom and a bride and a husband and a wife, we believe that that union that exists between Christ and the church is among them. And that's why we as Christians, particularly as Catholics, that we believe that we can't separate that. That's why it says in Scripture that what, what God has brought together, no man must separate. That we don't have the power to divide what God has brought together. So we'll get to kind of divorce at the end and where the church is with annulments and what an annulment really means. But we believe that we do not have the power or the authority to say that a, br a bride and a groom are no longer married. So when you hear like the Catholic Church doesn't believe in, in divorce, that, that's actually true. We don't. Um, because we don't believe that Christ can separate, be separate himself from the church nor the church separate itself from Christ. So, we're going to break down Ephesians chapter 5 here. These are actual quotes from Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. So, this could be translated to men, love all women as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her. So, how did Christ love the church? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What is the pattern and the model being given here? This is St. Paul. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
Paul is saying to all men, love your bride to the point of shedding your blood. Give everything. Offer everything. Give like Christ gave on the cross. Now, that can sometimes seem like completely like, what am I supposed to do? Like, go home and nail myself to my cross and be like, I totally love you. And like, whatever, slash myself. Like, whatever. This might be a little more tangible for you. How did Christ love the church on Holy Thursday night? He washed the disciples' feet. Husband, loves your, husbands, love your bride. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He radically served her. There's a couple, I did their wedding, and they were like, they went to, they're, anyways, they're a very pious couple. And <clears throat> the, he proposed to his bride, and he actually had a basin and towel ready and after he proposed to her, he actually said, I want to wash your feet. Because I want to like make it clear, like this is what I want to do. This is what I'm off. This, I'm in this game. How did Christ of the church on Holy Thursday night? What did he do? He says, this is my body given up for you. What does Christ do for the church on Holy Thursday night? He... He says, this is my body given up for you. Now, when he's hanging out on the cross, he could say the same thing. This is my body given up for you. When he's washing the feet, he could say, this is my body given up for you. We believe that these words actually encapsulate what it is to be a man in marriage. So a man should wake up every single day in a very true sense before his bride and say, this is my body, and I give it to you, my bride, and to our children. This is my body, and I give it to you, my bride, and my children. In a reciprocal way, by the way, the wife is going to say the same thing, but just a little bit different. But this is actually the calling that we believe marriage invites us to. As a priest, a man, every day I stand at the altar at least one time a day, sometimes three times a day. I take bread and wine, and I say, this is my body, give it up for you. At those words, that bread through the mystery of transubstantiation becomes Jesus' flesh and blood. But also, every time I say those words, I say those words to my bride. And who is my bride? Church. Which is all of you. So every single day, I say to my bride, this is my body, give it up for you. So when I get the phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning to go and visit someone who is dying, when it's my birthday and I have a funeral, this is my body, give it up for you. When it's a Thursday night and I don't want to teach RCIA because I'm tired and grumpy and I have other things I want to do, like binge Netflix or whatever. I don't even know how to do that, but like I just know that that's cool. <laughs> Play Fortnite all night. Like, I don't. Why? This is my body given up for you. So in a very true sense, masculinity, understood by St. Paul and by the church, is men who are willing to say, I give myself away. This is my body given up for you. And we as men, this is why men have barns and garages and storage units, because men love to do things. Men fail epically often on the ability to communicate well, express their emotions and their feelings. Women thrive in that realm, by the way. <laughs> men thrive in doing things. So they buy, they have to have garages and barns to have tools and to have the equipment to do things because they find their joy in doing and making things work and producing. Why? Well, let's look at a naked body of a man and it'll all make sense. So we just said the theology of a man is, this is my body given up for you. Here's a very famous statue. Who is this a statue of? David, after he slayed Goliath, who is the artist of this very famous statue? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Get it smart. Okay, what, are, uh, what is most notably different about a man's body than a woman's body? Two things. Number one, a man is bigger, faster, and stronger than a woman. 
Now, I do Spartan races, and I have met many women that are bigger, faster, and stronger than me, okay? <laughs> they scare me, and their, norm, their name is normally like Holga or something, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, a girl beat me at the Gobble Wobble. Her name was Megan. But, um, and it won't happen next year. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, a man is bigger, faster, and stronger than a woman. Yes, there are women who are bigger and faster than some men. But in the order of nature, in the Olympics, who is always bigger, faster, and stronger? A man. We normally don't ask the question, and now, like, in our political world, like, men can now, like, say that they're women and, like, enter the Olympics and, like, beat girls. Because that makes us feel good or something, I guess. Um, but why, why did God make, we, we, this, these, these are the things, we never ask why, we never ask why, we never ask why. Why does God make men bigger, faster, and stronger than women? To protect, defend, uplift, love, and glorify and serve their wife and their children to the point of death. That's why men are bigger, faster, and stronger than women. We live in a world where our food comes in plastic bags. We can order it on the internet and they'll deliver it to our house. Or we can use ClickList and pick it up ourselves. But like, the majority of us get all of our food without doing anything. That's not how God made us. Why are men bigger, faster, and stronger than women? To protect, defend, uplift, love, glorify, and serve their wife and children to the point of dying. That's why we're bigger, faster, and stronger. It's the only reason. Fallen man, meaning after the fall, what men get confused of why they're bigger, faster, and stronger. Why do some men think they're bigger, faster, and stronger? To rape, to seduce, to abuse, to take advantage of, to disregard the beauty of women. And that has nothing to do with God's plan. And yet many men get very confused about what their role is as a man. I'm just going to tell you, our porn culture is making this worse than it ever has been, I truly believe, convinced of it. The brainwashing of young boys at the age of 9 and 11 is the new norm. What's the second thing that's most no notable about a man's body that's different than a woman's? Look, very beautifully said is this. The sexual, reproductive, the sexual reproductive organs of a man's body are on the outside of his body, while the sexual reproductive organs of a woman are on the inside of her body. Once again, we never ask the question, why? Why? Well, if God made us in his image and his likeness, what do the sexual reproductive organs of a man on the outside of his body say? Well, they physically say, this is my body given up for you. When a man enters into a woman, literally, in the sexual act, he says, this is my body given up for you. This is my flesh and my blood that I offer to you. We'll see the analogy in the reciprocal ability of a woman, but what do the sexual reproductive organs of a woman say? That I'm able to receive your flesh and your blood. That we are able to become one, and you giving me your flesh and blood is actually able to bring forth life. Go back to the analogy of Christ and his church. What happens every time we then go to Holy Mass? What does Christ say at every single Holy Mass? This is my body given up for you. And who comes forward to receive Holy Communion every single Mass? Not just women, but the church. And what is the church? Feminine, the bride of Christ. And what does the church do at every single Holy Mass? It receives the flesh and blood of Jesus into her to become impregnated by divine grace to go out into the world and bring forth life. So the physical body of a man, bigger, faster, and stronger, protect, defend, uplift, love, glorify, and serve. The sexual reproductive organs of a man say, I give myself to you. I offer you my body and blood to change the world. We're going to take the theology of the body and also take it to the psychology of the body. What do you call the son of a king? A prince. What is the role of a prince? Well, in the average storyline, there's a princess who is desperately needed being saved. 
She's normally trapped in a tower. She has a, she has a cone head sometimes. Um, and there's like a streamer hanging from her cone. Um, there's a breathing dragon. And there's a prince. The prince shows up because he passionately loves the princess and he's willing to risk his life and die to slay the dragon and take the princess off to Never Everland. Basic plot, right? It's actually the story of salvation. Where the church is the woman, the prince is Christ, and Christ is willing to battle the dragon, Satan, to bring his bride, the church, to eternal paradise. Because Christ is a man and because we are men, written in the heart of every man is this burning desire to risk his life for the sake of the feminine. If you look at the heart of every masculine film, it's about men being willing to die or sacrifice themselves for the sake of the feminine. I just came from Panama where they speak Spanish. We in English don't have masculine and feminine endings to words, but in other languages they do. And it's very interesting. If you go into a man's barn, all of the things in his barn are actually feminine. All machines are actually feminine. If you know Spanish or Italian or German, all of those words are feminine. Boats are feminine, cars are feminine, machines are feminine. And what do men literally spend a lot of money and a lot of time on? They're women. How many films are about men who literally will fight for a woman or they're fighting for a car, a boat, or a nation. What is a nation? Feminine. We refer to our country as feminine. In fact, we refer to the whole entire earth as feminine. Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Why do you think men are so attracted to the woods and hunting? Because they're attracted to the feminine. If you look at Hollywood, like Hollywood is really, really smart. So these are the films, like these are like, I made this a few years ago, but nonetheless. Behind all of these films is this machoism ideal of a man where he's willing to die for the sake of a land, a country, a woman, and to give everything away. These films also are packed with lots of sexuality. So there's a lot of violence and a lot of sexuality, which is awesome. We're going to continue. So I think we all can agree that like young boys are absolutely addicted to video games. If you don't know that, um, talk to a young boy, uh, and they're totally addicted to video games. And the vast majority of the video games they play are about them slaughtering a few thousand people a day. And now we have uh, video games that actually have pornography in them as well, which is just fantastic because that only makes it better. Um, we're in a totally polarized world. I want you to see what Hollywood has done. At the age of eight, well, I, they say the average, average age of encountering pornography is, is now 9 to 11 years old. And that's also when they start becoming heavily addicted to video games. You have young boys who are totally addicted to violence and totally addicted to pornography. So here you have sacrifice and violence. Here you have women and lust. But notice where they're at. And this boy who's being raised on this believe somehow that both of them are totally masculine. Now let's look at Christ. Christ is willing to sacrifice himself, lay down his life, and die for the sake of the feminine. Both of these are like actually really, really good. 
these men, these young boys' attraction to sacrifice is really, really good. Risking lives, dying, it's, 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 really, it's part of their nature. Just like their love for women is part of their nature. The problem is, is that when they become unrelated, you end up with an, as, an, an emasculated man. Instead of, I'm a man who wants to lay down my life for the sake of a woman. I'm a man who's willing to deny my own thoughts, pleasures, wants, so that my wife and my children can thrive. So we don't need more violent porn, but what we need actually is for, for our world to wake up and to realize the true calling that there is to be truly masculine. This is my body given up for you. This is my life poured out for you. This is my body given up for you. This is my life poured out for you. Okay, now I'm going to move on to ladies. So. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through verse 24. Now we need to find the word submissive real quick here because it just gets confusing to people and it, people hate this passage. This passage is unbelievably awesome. We just need to understand the word submissive means it's totally fine. Submissive, break the word submissive down. Two words. Sub, what does it mean? Under. Under. So subway, subcontractor, sub uh, lease. Uh, give me another sub word. Submarine. Submarine. Fantastic. Um, Missive, Latin word, mission of. Missio is actually the word. Missi the mission of is what missio means. So submissive means under the mission of. So wives should be under the mission of their husbands. Now, what St. Paul, Paul is not saying here, wives should be under the submissive of completely and totally dumb men who want to abuse them. St. Paul didn't say that. Because St. Paul actually just defined what it was to be a man. St. Paul is saying, women, be submissive to men like that. Put yourself under the mission of men who will love you to the point of dying. And he continues, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church. As the church is submissive under the mission of Christ, so wives should be under the mission of their husbands in everything. So now we're going to talk about women being an image of the church. Every woman is called to be an image of the church. So what does the church do? Well, this is what the church does. I break it down into four things. The first goal of the church is to be receptive. If you think about like what we do as Christians, we receive baptism, we receive confirmation, we receive our first Holy Communion. Hopefully, every single wake, and I, I try every morning, when I try to wake up in the morning, one of the first things I do as a Christian is I wake up, and I try to begin my day by being open and receptive of God. I, hit the ground, my knees in the ground, and I say a prayer trying to open my life to God every single morning. What do I want to receive from God? Grace. What's the definition of grace? The life of God. So every day we want to receive the life of God. Once we receive the life of God, the life of God becomes one with us. It's called a relationship. So I conceive God within me. I become one with God. I have received, I've accepted Jesus, the life of God, into me in an intimate relationship. Once I know this, I then want to bring Jesus out to the world. I want to evangelize. I want to share Jesus with everybody. I want to talk about Jesus. I want the whole world to have what I have. But then I get exhausted. So I need to be nourished. So where do I go to be nourished? I go back to my parish to receive the Eucharist, to receive confession, to find silence, to read my Bible. This is what the church does. It's a cycle. Receive, conceive, bring forth life, nurture it. What do I receive? Grace, relationship, evangelization, and the nurturing of the church. The amazing thing is, this is what the church does, but this is actually what every, every woman's body does. Where are the sexual reproductive organs of a woman's body? On the inside. What is, what, a woman has the ability to receive another person into her. A woman has the ability to do what? To conceive a child. Like, my belly does nothing. Like, nothing. I mean, it has a six-pack and stuff, but like, still. <laughs> like, the only output of my belly is black belly button lint every day. Like, it's so lame. 
Like a woman's belly has the ability to, to conceive a child. A woman has the ability to conceive, to, to bring, not just conceive a child, but actually bring forth life, which is why we know that men can't have babies, because no man could ever do that. He would die in the process, because it would hurt so bad. And what is the real reason that women have breasts? We'll find out many reasons during the halftime of the Super Bowl of why women have breasts. <laughs> they will sell everything from cars to beer to God only knows what in 2019. But why do women really have breasts? To feed the child that, that they've conceived and brought forth. So what is a woman? And it really, I mean, like, it's so awesome, like, when we really think about it. Like, it really is so true. Like, a woman is the church. And I was telling you, as a priest, like, I live, live, in, I live in this really weird world where I am called to be both. So, like, I am called to be Jesus. So, like, people want me to give and give and give and to be tough sometimes and to say what needs to be said. And, like, you need to be, like, a real manly priest. And then... Then they come to my office, and they, all they really want me to be is they want me to be a woman. Because they come to my office, and they don't, want me to be, they don't want me to be a priest anymore. They want me to be a priest, but they really want me to be the church. They want me to do what? Listen. They want me to empathize. They want me to cry with them. They want me to be real sensitive. Well, why do they want that? Because that's what the church is. The church feeds more people, clothes more people, educates more people, comforts more people, heals more people than any other institution in the world. Because that's what women do. I'm not saying that men can't do those things, but where do women thrive? Doing those things because we as men are dumb, insensitive, and all we want to do is build things and fart. <laughs> because we're men. Going back to this, a woman is a bride, a woman uh, is the church, and the church is married to Christ, and her body beautifully proclaims this. Now, the amazing thing is that there was a 14-year-old girl, so, like, and this is the part to always remember, like, women, right here, who are you really called to marry? So if Timmy marries Susie, and Susie marries Timmy, who is Susie really wanting to marry in the depths of her heart? She really wants to marry Jesus. Which puts a lot of pressure on Timmy. Because the reality is that Timmy is probably a jerk, self-centered, and a loser. Like most men, including myself, on some really rough days. So it can be hard. It can also be really hard that, like, Timmy wants Susie to be the church. When people walk into her office, I mean, like, I, I've only heard women, I've only heard sometimes, and I, sometimes I hear from husbands every now and then, that, like, their wives aren't always very nice. Sometimes they can be sometimes harsh or rude or whatever else. But if I treated the people that walk to my office sometimes like men get treated by their wives, like, our parish office would be shut down. Like every time someone walks in the front office of the office of the church, they are expecting the perfect church. And the reality is, is like every man who marries, like every Timmy who marries a Susie needs to know that like Susie's not always going to be Susie. <laughs> Sometimes Susie's going to be Shanene, you know what I mean? <laughs> However, all this being in mind, there was a point where there was a woman who was a human being who actually married God who actually received, conceived, brought forth life, and nurtured God. And that is Mary. Mary actually received the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived. That's actually an awesome painting of a pregnant Mary, which we often never see, ever. There's actually a really awesome statue of Mary uh, two summers ago. Was it two summers ago at the festival exhibit? It was, it's beautiful. I need to get one. Then, um, so... Receive, conceive, bring forth life, and nurture in her breast. That shouldn't be scandalous to us. Because that's what Jesus did. That should actually say that is the church feeding her young. That is Mary, femininity, feeding Christ. What does a woman do? Receive, conceive, bring forth life, and nurture it. What does the church do? 
every day, meaning individual members, when I say the church, and the church collectively, receive, conceive, bring forth life, nurture it. What does the body of a woman proclaim? That she's a daughter of a king. What do you call the daughter of a king? A princess. Who is the prince that ultimately will come to sweep the princess off her, her feet? It's Jesus. In every Disney film, there is a princess. In every Disney film, there is a prince. Prince Charming, I'd watch out. Kind of gets around. But in every single Disney film, there is a prince and there is a princess. And they're madly in love with each other. In every single Disney film. We never ask the question, why, though, do we? In every Disney film, there is an evil character. In every Disney film, who does the power of evil attack? In every Disney film. The prince. No. In, the power, in every Disney film, who does the power of evil hate and want to attack? The girl. In every Disney film. And in every Disney film, who has to save the princess from the power of evil? The prince. Why? We never ask the question why. Because that's what happened in the book of Genesis. Who did the power of evil appro approach in the book of Genesis? Who did the serpent approach in the book of Genesis? Eve. Eve. Not because Eve is the weaker sex, not because Eve is a woman, but because Eve is a symbol of the church, Eve is a symbol of all of humanity, and who is the man a symbol of? Christ. Can the serpent take down Christ? No. But if the serpent destroys the church, meaning humanity, then Christ is pointless. What does Satan want to do anyways? He wants to make the incarnation pointless. He wants to make God's power pointless. So he goes after the woman, which is the church, and in doing so, he's able to attack Christ, and Christ falls. There's tremendously powerful stuff here, like really re rich, deep stuff in the theology of the body. Uh, by the way, who painted this? Okay. <laughs> I was like, don't trick us. <laughs> I know, I know. This is on the Sistine Chapel as well, by the way. It's both, this is the serpent, Eve, Adam, this is them being dispelled from the garden, all in the same painting. He did a lot of that up on there where there are like two things happening in the same thing. Okay, Matthew chapter 19, go home and read it. But Matthew chapter 19, Jesus makes it very, very clear that Christian marriage is not going to be like Jewish marriage. That women will not be treated as objects, that women will not be able to be divorced. And he ultimately returns them to the garden. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus actually says, In the beginning it was not so. He's taking Christians back to the book of Genesis and saying, I am going to give you the grace, the life of God, to live marriage as it was originally intended. Union and indissolubility. When we use the word indissolubility, the, the, the easiest way for me to remember indissolubility is, is to think of dissolve. So if I dissolve a sugar packet into my coffee, which I don't do, by the way, but if I was to do that, indissolubility means that I can't dissolve a sugar packet into my coffee. Just like I can't dissolve the marriage between a man and a woman. So marriage is indissoluble. And the union between husband and wife is irrevocable. And God is going to give us the grace to do so. Revelation chapter 19 is ultimately the marriage feast of the Lamb and the fact that we will ultimately be married to God in heaven. So in the book of Genesis... What God created and created Adam and Eve, who are going to become three, ultimately an image of the Trinity. What we find ultimately in the book of in the book of Revelation is that God actually wants to marry us. 
So this analogy between husband and wife, male, female, Christ, church, is that our ultimate end is to be with God forever in heaven, which is what marriage is a symbol of here on earth. When we ask the question of <clears throat> what is the naked body of a man, naked body of a woman symbolized, they symbolize between the union between Christ and his church, which then become fully realized in heaven. So marriage is supposed to be ultimately a model of heavenly marriage. Earthly marriage is supposed to be caught up in heavenly marriage. Earthly marriage caught up in heavenly marriage. This is continuing down just kind of like the whole like experiential part. Like, why do women long for their wedding day? Like, if you ask like most girls, like beginning like in their teenage years, like when they go to a wedding, whether they know it or not, they are beginning an internal file of how their wedding is going to be. They start choosing colors, they start choosing dresses, they start choosing their bridesmaids, they start choosing their reception halls, they start choosing their music. And guys at wedding receptions just want to get drunk. <laughs> or get out of there, period. I, I've only one time in my 16 years of marriage have ever had a groom come into my office that he is doing all the wedding planning. In, I kid you not, in one of my marriages, he came in and he like told me, he's like, yeah, I've chosen the colors and they're going to be blue and yellow and like from Mich Michigan. Uh, and like he like said, like, he, I, was, I just sat there like, wow, the, wow, okay. No joke. They were divorced in a year and a half. Thus proving <laughs> that guys shouldn't pick out the wedding colors for a wedding. And girls over here who are married, if you ever run into it, like, if he starts doing that, these people are engaged. If he starts picking out your wedding colors, you don't even know what color is, do you? See, I didn't think so. That's why you're going to be great in your marriage. But why do women long for their wedding day? Because the Jewish people, which is the people of God, are still longing for the Messiah to come. The whole Old Testament, which is actually larger than the New Testament, is actually the story of a pe the people of God, all of humanity, longing for the coming of the Messiah. What is the New Testament? Jesus has come, but what are we still longing for? For Jesus to come at the end of time. The second coming of Christ. This is why during Advent we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Because we we're still praying for God to come again. Who is praying for God to come again? The church. Who is the church? Women. So who longs in to get married? Women. It's very rare that you will see a man begging a woman to propose to him. Hmm, interesting, isn't that? But how often do you find a girl who's like dying for a guy to propose to her? Hmm. Quite often. How often do you see a young girl, particularly a high school girl or a college girl, who literally gives herself away again and again and again and again and again to a bunch of men who are a bunch of jerks because the hole in her heart to be loved is bigger than anything. And you end up with scars and wounds and damage. Why do men not long for their wedding days? Why is it that the girl is often begging for the proposal but the man won't do it? Who is the man an image of? The man is an image of... Christ. Where was Christ the night before he gave his body and blood to his bride? He gave his body and blood to his bride on the cross on Good Friday. Where was he Holy Thursday night? Sweating blood. Um, look at this dude. Yeah. Sweating blood where? What do we, what do we normally call that? The, the agony in the garden. What was he saying? Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will be done. A.K.A. God, get me out of here. The last thing I want to do is do this. Where are the majority of the men the night before they get married? Thanks be to God, this is not our Catholic culture, because Catholic culture forces you to have a writing rehearsal the night before. <laughs> In movies, where are guys the night before they get married? Where? Strip club. Strip club. Bar. Drunk. 
What what are, what are, what are they emotionally saying? Get me out of here. I really don't want to do this. What are they afraid of? This is my body giving up for you. Women are dying to fill the hole in their heart. Men are scared to sacrifice and lay down. Why do men fall on their knees? As I always like to say. Because it's easier to wash our feet from this position than standing. Why do men fall on their knees? Because this is the proper position of a servant before the one he's called to serve. Why do men propose? What are the two things about a man's body? Bigger, faster, and stronger. What's the second part? This is my body given up for you. Who initiates salvation? God or people? God. The people of God can beg for salvation all they want, but God has to give it. The Jewish people are still begging for salvation. They just missed it. So men have to actually propose to the woman. As odd as it is, this is still kept in our culture. I haven't yet had a bride and groom show up where like the bride's like, yeah, I'm like a total feminist, so like I propose, and he said yes to me. I'd be like, uh, warning sign, flag, flag, flag. But a man proposed because it, that's the theology of the body. His body actually ha forces him to in a certain sense. Okay, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live in this humanity? So what do our bodies proclaim? The love between Christ and his church. Sexual difference. Union and communion. And the sexual act most intimately proclaims this. And that means that actually the sexual act is called to be a total union of husband and man, husband and wife, which ultimately binds them into an exchange that is holy. All of this means that our bodies are holy. The majority of the world hates their bodies, despises their bodies. But our bodies actually proclaim who God is, our body is holy, and that marriage is holy. A lot of people think, oh, well, religious sisters, they're holy. Oh, priests, they're holy. Well, no, marriage is holy. We believe in marriage is a covenant that's free, faithful, and fruitful. Free... When we, ask this, when we say that someone's free to marry, it means that, number one, they're not related to the person that they're marrying. Number two, they're not being pressured or coerced. So it's not a shotgun wedding. They aren't getting married because she's pregnant. She's not marrying him for the money. Ain't nothing but a gold digger. They don't have a prenup. So there's total freedom. Either of them is not drunk or under the use of drugs. Okay? Faithful, meaning that they're entering into a covenant where they both believe that they're in this for life until death do us part. If one of them dies, they can get remarried. But the covenant aspect means that they're actually there to be totally faithful and that they want to be fruitful, that they want children. The marriage is not just about the two of us. It's about us giving of ourselves to each other so much that we'll actually, our love will expand. Our love will become outside of us. And thus will become fruitful. In fact, what's interesting, these are the three questions that are asked at the altar. And what is the opposite of these? What do we, in the sexual act, what is the, what is the sexual act that doesn't involve free will? Right. What is the sexual act that doesn't involve faithfulness? Adultery. What is the sexual act that doesn't involve fruitfulness? It's not actually going to say the sexual act. What is it? A contraceptive act or ultimately abortion. I refuse to bring forth life. So we see it like at the heart of these is, is true marriage. At the extreme is abuse, hurt, and death at the opposite end of marriage. What are the two purposes of marriage? Marriage exists for two reasons. One is children. Like, marriage exists for children because marriage is the best place for children. And it's the logical end of two individuals that are going to give themselves totally emotionally, mentally, Physically, 
and sexually and spiritually. God willing, if they're blessed, they will receive children in that. So the two ends of marriage are children, and the other one is union, communion, and sanctification. The goal of marriage is that I'm going to sanctify my spouse. I'm going to make my spouse a better person. And I'm going to go in union and communion with my spouse. So, let's talk about divorce and let's talk about homosexuality. So, um, we spoke a little bit earlier, we touched a little bit earlier on, on divorce and why in Matthew 19, it makes it clear that divorce is no longer issued or allowed under Christ's command of marriage. So the church, trying to be merciful, has what is known as the annulment process. The annulment process, the goal of the annulment process, is to look at a marriage and to ultimately, through a tribunal, through a court, declare that what was thought to be a marriage is not a marriage. So when someone wants an annulment, they ultimately give testimony, like it, it, it's, it's really a court trial, normally all done through paperwork, but people give testimony, and then through their testimony, they ultimately proclaim, with witnesses and, and, and the etc., that what we thought was a free, faithful, and fruitful union, that one of those wasn't there. That freedom wasn't there, faithfulness wasn't there, or fruitfulness wasn't there. And the church is actually able to say, okay, it, evidence is clear that freedom, faithfulness, or fruitfulness wasn't there, which means that there wasn't a covenant. What we thought was marriage really wasn't marriage. So the church strives in really it, 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 to be faithful to Scripture as best as she can, while at the same time trying to say, how do we... How do we mercifully help people remain in the church and to receive the sacraments and to be able to love within the church? <clears throat> I just want to bring up this topic as well, the topic of homosexuality, just because it is related to this topic. Um, I want to heavily, heavily recommend that you all go home and watch a 28-minute movie. You can find it on YouTube or Vimo. Um, it's called The Third Way. It is... It is without a doubt the best resource you will ever watch that teaches the church's teaching on homosexuality. It is remarkably done. We actually just showed it to our youth group a month ago here at St. Martin's. Um, it's really, really, really well done. But it's important at, at the essence of what the church teaches about homosexuality is this. And it's not, the church doesn't get into the battle a whole bunch about whether homosexuality is by nurture or by nature, meaning that like the homosexual person, their desires, they were either born that way or the desire was brought about psychologically through experiences of their childhood. The church leaves that battle alone. What the church says, though, is that someone who experiences same-sex attraction, that that person is called to be loved. Just as if someone who has attractions, if I'm attracted to, to drinking too much alcohol, I'm called to be loved. If I have attractions to gambling, I'm called to be loved. If I have attractions towards violence, I'm called to be loved. But what am I also called to do? I'm called to not act upon attractions that are not according to God's will. If I'm attracted to alcohol, I'm called to restrain that retraction. If I'm called to gamble, I'm called to restrain that attraction. If I'm called to violence, if I have an attraction to violence, I'm called to restrain that, that attraction. If I have homosexual tendencies, I'm called to restrain and not act upon that. Just as if I'm, a, if I, if I'm in a teenage relationship, a boy and a girl are dating in high school, and they feel an attraction to, home, to, to sexually act with each other, the church is going to say, restrain that attraction and wait until you're married. The church is saying, you do not have to act on every impulse in your life. Our world right now is saying, any impulse you have, you have to act on it. The only impulse that we're currently saying you can't act on 
his sexual encounters with a minor, but I, I'm, I'm not even joking. Like, I think that's going to be out the door soon. As, as crazy as that is. But just as the church would say, if you have a desire to have sex with a child, you need to not act upon that because that's not according to God's will. The only time that we would say that someone should act upon their sexual desires is in a relationship that's this. That's this. When there's freedom, faithfulness, and fruitfulness. If a, cat, if, if, a, if a sexual act can't be free, faithful, and fruitful, then you, sh you shouldn't act upon it. So in homosexuality, the fruitfulness is never a possibility. In a teenage sexual relationship, fruitfulness is never desired. And there can't really be faithfulness in either of those. So the church is going to say, we're going to ask you to restrain from your desires, not because we want to hurt you and we want your life to be miserable, but because we want you to actually thrive. So the church has some really good documents out on homosexual desires and on the past there's actually a great document called the pastoral care of homosexual persons which is a, a great document that was written I think in the, in the, in the mid 1990s just about that ultimately we're called to love people with same-sex attraction we cannot endorse or encourage them to act upon these desires but we're called to love them and that's because that's what Christ would do I encourage you to watch the third way it's really 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 good Really good. We're going to take a break. Go get some food and stuff. And we'll come back for Q&A.